Good morning. Trying to see if I'm on here. Okay, let's try that again. Good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. Uh, Welcome to all our visitors this morning. And I just have a lot of things, uh, announcements this morning. I just want to try to get them done before we get started. Um, First thing is that uh, we have a lot of people that do stuff in this church that aren't recognized. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who works behind the scenes to do stuff. And when you're not uh, standing up on this stage or teaching a class or something like that, it's hard to uh, see you. But I know I see people cleaning the church and uh, bringing food and doing all the things that, that keep the, the church running. And I just want to say thank you to all those people. Um, I have a, a few slides I just want to run through. The first one is uh, about the preschool, speaking of people that are unrecognized. Uh, the people that run our preschool every day and operate it, they are the most unrecognized people uh, that this this church. Our preschool is one of our biggest ministries. We uh, teach kids about Jesus every single day at that preschool. We have chapel every day and teach the kids about uh, Jesus. And the the things that come out of that preschool, we, we see kids get baptized now. Um, because we're teaching older kids, and it's it's pretty amazing. So I, I just want to run through um, the ways we can support our preschool, and this is a slide that will be up there every Sunday now. Um, pray for them. We have teachers in this room that they don't make a lot of money. We don't pay the best. We don't pay the best at our preschool because it's a ministry. We have to be able to um, support kids that financially cannot. Uh, afford to go to a a Christian preschool and so if you would pray for them pray for their families they're doing it pretty much because they have it's it's out of the goodness of their heart they're not getting paid a lot of money to teach at the preschool so please just pray for them Um, the cost of everything has gone up tremendously Uh, so if we have cut out a lot of things and are asking parents to bring more and if you can help support by bringing paper towels toilet paper, cleaning wipes. Please just get with Stacy and Deanna or Tammy or Miss Paige, any of those people that are here regularly. If you want to drop something off that they can use, please just do that. Um, you can help with the maintenance list. Stacy brought in a maintenance list that was a mile long the other day. If you have time and you can get over there and change a doorknob or change a lock or something, just, just go over there and say, hey, can I, can I help you do that, all right? Um, volunteer your time. Now, this isn't for everybody because uh, if you're going to go over there and you're going to be in a classroom volunteering, you have to have a, a background check and you have to, to uh, uh, pass a class. wouldn't be a hard class, but you still have to take the class. If you're a retired person or someone's got extra time and you want to go over there and rock a baby, you, she would be more than happy to get you a background check and to get the, the class taken care of for you, okay? And then the last thing is financial support. We have a, a list of things that we want to be able to do at the preschool, and we need funds to be able to do that stuff. And if you feel led to give, to be able to uh, maybe put a privacy fence around the... Uh, the playground back there so that they can't be seen from the road. Uh, we would love to uh, just for you to just contribute and say, please put this towards whatever you have going on. Yes, Brian. And just a reminder, it is a mission. That's right. It's a mission of the church. That's how it's counted. Um, and I know a lot of people think that we're just going to say, yeah. Yeah, and and we we do we we can offer you um, you know a, a tax exempt form. It is it is part of the church. It falls under the church umbrella. So if you give monetarily, that'll be counted just like everything else that you you give in your offering. And it is a mission. I think that we we miss that uh, that goal sometimes. Is that our preschool is we are outreach. 
And we should be um, taking advantage of the events the preschool has. We should be going to the open houses and the graduations and speaking with parents and trying to spread the word, all right? Um, so our next slide is uh, we have a senior slide. This slide is just so that you can give us uh, your pictures of your graduates. I would love to put pictures up of your graduates in advance, like in our uh, announcement loop. And then we'll have everybody senior by senior Sunday is my goal. So uh, we have a lot that are um, in college or that have just gone off and we don't want to miss anybody. Uh, that's my main goal is I just don't want to miss anybody when we, when we recognize them. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, we'll, we'll try to get everybody recognized. We just, we just want to make sure we don't miss anybody. So uh, you can scan that code and upload a picture, and we'll have it, and we'll put it on the list. And it's on the bulletin, too. All right? What's that? What's that? Okay, all right. We got a list that we – if you just get those to me or Michael Lane, we'll, we'll get those added to the list. All right? Um, the third slide is an uh, update on our VBS project. If you see that uh, bookshelf in the back, Mr. Larry McKinnon built that bookshelf. It's absolutely beautiful, and we want to thank him. Our VBS project was something that Andrea had uh, thought up, and it, that is we um, raise money to buy just regular kids' books. We have Bibles and Bible studies, and what happens is the, it's at the school's discretion, but they can award these kids based off of good behavior if they've help someone, if they see them going out of their way to be kind, they get a, a reward and they get to go to our bookshelf and they get to pick a book, a Bible, or a Bible study out. And the school has posted these on their Facebook page and you see everybody in that picture right there has got a Bible study or a Bible that they picked out of that. And for us to be able to get the Word of God in kids' hands was our mission and it's succeeding. So... Um, we want to say thank you to everyone that sent money with their kids or has been involved in that in any way. Thank you so much, Mr. Larry, for building that, those bookshelves. We really appreciate you. And then the last thing is, is I don't think I have a slide for it, but the church app, if you um, haven't signed up, please, if you need help, uh, let me know. We want to get everybody involved in that so that way we can take off and do more things with it, like put groups in there, put our schedules in there would be nice. And uh, so if you need help, just come see me for that one. Yeah, and, and we can even start sending out uh, important announcements on the app if we get everybody signed up. So um, with that being said, I think that's all I have. So if you will stand with me, we'll do our scripture reading. No junior church today. I forgot about that one. Yes, no junior church today. So uh, keep your kids in here. All right. Hebrews 9:11 But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come then through the greater and more perfect tent not made with hands that is not of this creation let's pray Father thank you so much for just allowing us to be here this morning Father I just pray that we'll turn our focus to you Father that we would lift our eyes to you we'll lift our voices to you Father let our praises resonate your name this morning. Let us let our hearts um, just seek you uh, this morning as as we worship. It's in your name we in your name we pray. Amen. I asked JJ he did such a good job of that. If he'd like to lead singing, he, he had that you know ear mites in his ears. He shook his head. When we all get to heaven, we want to go there for sure. Amen. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day. Big dog. 
Us of humans have wandering minds, some more than others, but from time to time I myself wonder how heaven will be. Here are a few verses that can help us visualize it. Revelation 21.4 says, 
He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 49 reads, But someone will ask, How are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies, and what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star in glory. So it is, it with, it is with the resurrection of the dead, what is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, become a living being, the last Adam become a, living, giving, a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of, du- of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. First Thessalonians 4, 14, 17. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will ascend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught, caught up together and then with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Revelation 7, 9 through 12. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Just a few more. Revelation 4, 8, And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Revelation 7.15, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. In Romans 8.18-25, 8, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first, first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees, but if we hope for what we do not see, 
We wait for it with patience. Those verses may give you a glimpse of heaven or what will happen. That is the feel-good part. Now the gut check part is how to receive that reward. Be Christ-like. Believe, repent, be baptized, and walk the Christian walk. As most of you can attest, that sometimes isn't the easiest to do. But with Jesus bearing all our sin and pain and suffering, it gives us hope of eternal life with him and a glimpse of heaven. What a day that will be. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this Lord's Day. You've just allowed us to meet around your house, Lord, and worship you. Lord, as we come to this time in our service, uh, we pray that we uh, will take these emblems and, Lord, uh, just take them according to you, Lord, and uh, just knowing what they rep represent for you. In your name we pray. Amen. For those who are, for those who are our guests this morning, uh, we take it all together. So take a cup. It's got both the bread and the juice. Um, and we will all read and do the uh, communion together. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took a cup. After supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And he also writes, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And all God's people said, All right. Well, I know there's no children's church, but... There is children here. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me, Zovane. So we'll still do our little talk, and, and you guys can either choose to sit quietly up front or go back to your seats. 
Are you holding a can of toxic waste? Yes. Oh, it's a piggy bank that looks like no. toxic waste. No, it's not. Oh, it's a secret snack chamber. Yes. That's filled with toxic waste. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Well, this actually was. It is toxic waste. Oh, okay. Well, I want to ask y'all a question. I know it's a big surprise. But what are some ways when you do something that you feel bad about that you try to make up for it? I do that a lot. Well, hands up though. Yes, sir. How is punching your brothers making up for the bad you've done? You don't know. Son, in our house, that's usually not a good thing, but a common occurrence. Yes, sir. Forgiving someone, but what about the bad you've done? Forgiving yourself is a big deal. Asking for forgiveness. Asking for forgiveness from God. Asking for forgiveness from the person and asking for forgiveness from God. Did you still want to go? No, she's done. That was your, you know, it's a good thing though. And it usually bears repeating. Yes, sir. You say you're sorry, you be kind, you be more kind. And you ask for forgiveness to the person and God and you ask if okay. they forgive you and if they say. So you change your attitude on top of asking for forgiveness. Yeah. I like that. Okay, so let's move on though. I, yeah, go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Woo. It's better to tell the truth than a lie because if you lie to cover it up, you'll get more, you get more trouble when you inevitably get caught. Absolutely. One more. Don't cover up the sins. Yeah, that's true. You can't hide the truth beneath your feet. Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story about that called The Telltale Heart. I suggest reading it sometime. Oh, you did. It's a good one, isn't it? Now, let me go ahead and put your hand down. But what if I was to tell you this, though? Even though we can say we're sorry, even though we can ask for forgiveness, and we can try to make it right, we still have to deal with the things we did, right? So, like, if you were to lie to me, every time you spoke to me, what do you think might be in the back of my mind? Is he lying? is he lying? Is she lying? That's exactly right. Or are they lying if or am I lying? you came and took something out of my office without permission and I asked you or, or, and I caught you doing it, every time you come to my office, what might I be thinking? Did he steal it? Yeah. Is he going to take something else? Yeah. Or now, the reason I say this is we can make up for things in our earthly life. We could try to do that. But not in the heavenly life. Stand by. You're close, but let me, let, me, let me continue on this line. It doesn't erase the things we've done. We can be forgiven, but it doesn't erase the fact that we did those things. True or false? false. Like if you punch your brother, is your brother going to remember you punched him? Yes. It happens so often in our house, you're probably going to ask which time. But it's going to happen. You're gonna, somebody's going to remember those things you've done. And in the Old Testament, which is what we're going to be studying today, there are two people. I'm going to give you, some, I'm going to give you one kind of normal name and one really funny name. There's a, a, a couple of visions we're looking at. One's a guy named Joshua. We can remember Joshua pretty easily, right? Anybody know a Joshua? He's like right there putting his head on the pew. <laughs> well, he was. There's another guy, and I'm pretty sure you've never went to school with somebody with this name. His name's Zerubbabel. Say that with me. You even said it wrong. It's Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. There you go. Please don't go naming your kids Zerubbabel just to prove me wrong. Put your hand down. And the reason we're talking about these people is at the time, this had been after the temple had been destroyed and the people of Israel had been dispersed among the nations and, and God was bringing them back in and they were going to rebuild the temple. Well, Joshua was the high priest. The problem is the priesthood had done some bad things. And a guy named Zerubbabel was not a king, but he was the governor, and he was also of the line of David. He's actually mentioned in both 
Mary and Joseph's genealogies in Luke and Matthew, Zerubbabel. And God gives Zechariah, the prophet we're reading today, some words of comfort. But the thing is, he also points towards the future. Because there is a way our wrongs can be forgiven. And we know now that we have the ability to look back that it was from Jesus Christ who lived perfectly. He was God. Though he was born of a virgin, he was God. He walked on earth as one of us, lived according to all of God's righteous requirements. And he died in our place. He died to conquer our sin and pay the penalty for our wrongs. But when he rose again, he conquered the consequence of sin, which is death. So that if you believe in Jesus Christ, death no longer has a consequence for you. Because for us, Paul writes, and just like all those wonderful verses Taylor read today, there's another verse I love. Paul writes, didn't you know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? Because of what Jesus did, our sins can be forgiven. And God does forgive us according to His own righteous requirements. Because Jesus did it all for us. Pretty cool, huh? So, you had one thing, one more. He had his hand up patiently. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hope from God can lift our weighted minds. Hope from God can lift our weighted minds. Amen, brother. All right, go ahead and head back to your seats. And we will go ahead and get started this morning. Usually I dismiss them somewhere else, but we're there. If I can uh, ask the guys, if you can go back to that Bible slide verse, there's two verses. I want us to begin with that. If you'll stand as we read the Word of God together. I want to read these two verses. These are so important, and I think they, they can help us understand what we're reading this morning. Hebrews 9, 11 to 12 says, But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. And all God's people said, Amen. please be seated. See, in the Old Testament system, and this is possibly why it was most distressing that the temple was in ruins and that they were in exile, um, and even though they were starting to come back, it still seemed hopeless, was because according to the old Mosaic law, something had to die for your sin. I don't know about you, I don't own sheep, but if I did back then, I'd probably need to give them at least once a day. Because by no means I'm perfect. You made sacrifices for atonement. You made sacrifices for uh, gifts to, the, to, to God as love offerings. You made sacrifices of grain and of wine and, and of oil and all, all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and the purpose of it all was to restore relationship to God because, let's face it, we're all stained. I don't know about y'all, but there's things I've done in my life that no matter how hard I try, I can't make up for. I can't. Because I've done them. <laughs> Once they're done, you can't take them back. It's like a story I, 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 I've been telling since I was a youth minister back in the day. It's like words. There was a little boy who was friends with this little girl and all his buddies at school. And I'm pretty sure many of us have been in this circumstance. But they were teasing her because her two front teeth had fallen out. She talked and looked funny. And the little boy, not wanting to be alienated from the crowd, jumped in. And she heard him say those mean and awful things. So he is distressed because she won't talk to him anymore. And he goes to his preacher and says, what can I do to make up for what I said? The preacher has this Ziploc bag full of feathers. And he says, okay, here's what I want you to do. Take these feathers, go down in the middle of town, open up the bag and shake them all out. The boy goes, I, I don't see how that'll help, but I'll, I'll try. So he goes and does just what the preacher says. He shakes them all out. Feathers go everywhere, all to the different areas. The wind blows them. And he goes back to his preacher and says, all right, now what? 
preacher says, go and collect them all up again. He says, how's that? That's impossible. How am I supposed to do that? He goes, exactly. When you speak, those words are already released. You can't take them back again. In the same way, when we sin, that's just like what happens. We've done the action. And many of us who've even been in the middle of an action, as soon as that action, we're in the middle of it, like, you know, I don't know about y'all, but I've been in certain fights when I was younger and, and, and things like that, and I knew in the middle of throwing that swing, I can't take it back even though I wanted to, but the action was already done and I was already in the middle of it, and it happened. And while guys recover from things swifter than that, I mean, some of your best friends you got from a fist fight, the action still remains. Can't take it back. People remember those things. And no matter what, and it says in Hebrews, we can't still take back the sin we've done. We're going to have to sacrifice every single day according to the old Mosaic law. But God had a purpose and a plan to once for all deal with sin. Because God, from the beginning... Wanted to redeem mankind. We know what happened back in the Garden of Eden. And, and there's different schools of thought as to what actually happened there. But uh, uh, Eve was speaking to the serpent. And in my belief, because it says Adam was with her, Adam stayed silent. And he watched to make sure his wife wasn't going to drop dead. That's my interpretation of it. I could be wrong. But it says she gave some to her husband who was with her. So what was he doing? She ate the fruit. She didn't drop dead. So what did he do? He ate the fruit. And in doing so, he violated both of God's mandates. He was to be his husband, or a, a husband and, and watch over his wife that God had given him. But he was also to watch over the ground that God had given him and not do what God told him not to do. And so if you look at the curses of Adam, they're worse than both what the serpent and the woman got. Cursed is the ground because of you. The reason we die, because death entered into the world through sin, as uh, Taylor had read this morning. Cursed is the ground. We have floods and fires and famines and earthquakes and typhoons and all sorts of things because sin entered into the world. God's good, perfect world was ruined by our rebellion and disobedience. But God, Eve who ate first, received not just merely a curse but a blessing. Because when God cursed the serpent, He gave the woman a blessing. From her seed shall come your enemy. You'll be at enmity with each other, is what it says. And He will crush your head, though you will bruise His heel. That's that fatal wound from the serpent. It was God's plan from the beginning to redeem us from ourselves. And God himself, before he dismissed Adam and Eve from this paradise he had given them, made the first sacrifice on their behalf so that there could still be some semblance of relationship there. And the purpose of the tabernacle that you heard mentioned and the temple and the sacrifices, it existed so that God could have some semblance of relationship until the fullness of time came and Christ entered into the world. God had this plan from the beginning. And try as we might, we keep messing it up, don't we? I do. I'm like a southern driver during an icy season. I don't know what to do half the time. But God. God knows me and loves me anyway. It says in Scripture that while I was yet His enemy, Christ died for me. But God. And here's the thing about the forgiveness of God. Though we may have to deal with the earthly consequences of our sin, though Israel was coming back and inhabiting the land again, they still had to deal with a ruined temple. God still restored. And through Christ Jesus, once for all, sin is forgiven. You don't have to keep apologizing to Jesus. I do, to be honest with you, I still do. But when he said it is finished and gave up his breath for the last time on the cross, he meant what he said. It was fulfilled. 
And so today, as we look at these two chapters, we see two promises. One given to Joshua, and and I'm going to be honest with you, as as a scripture buff, as somebody who dives deep into meanings and words, it just tickles me to death that the high priest at the time was named Joshua. Some of you are looking at me funny. If you don't know Hebrew, Jesus was not his name in Hebrew. It was Yeshua. And the Greeks turned the word into Yesu, but since they add s at the end, like, you know, all their names like, uh, I don't know, Clavicus and all those other things, they added S, became Yesus. And when they translated the Greek into English, we got Jesus because we like to judge things. But Jesus' name actually was Joshua. More akin to that in the Hebrew words. And so something that we need to understand is that when we read through Scripture, God is in the details. There's little things that we pass up all the time without even realizing it. And I've now, I'm I'm going through my, I don't know how many year in the Bible studies, I'm still discovering new things every time I open it. And this promise to Joshua the high priest is not merely a contemporary promise to the Israel then who is just filling the land and rebuilding the temple. It's a promise for a future hope where someday sin shall once for all be forgiven and a new high priest will take over in replacement of the shadow of things to come. And that old order was abolished on the cross of Christ when the one sacrifice that needed to be made had been made. We no longer need to sacrifice because Christ paid it all. As Isaiah says in that beautiful old hymn, sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed us white. Because of Christ Jesus, you and I can come before God. We don't need any other intermediary because Jesus is our high priest. He's entered into the most holy place. He stands before God and he speaks your name and mine if we belong to him. Now, I want to caution us with this before we dive right into the Word. Bear in mind, you can know everything about Jesus, but maybe He doesn't know you. And I say this because I'm a passing baseball fan. I don't know stats and statistics, or stats and statistics, I just repeated myself. I don't know statistics like some of y'all do, but I've known people in my life who have known literally every baseball stat from 1911 all the way to modern day. And I've ridden in eight-hour cars, car rides with some of those guys while they were talking to each other and just kind of left me out. And I often think of those conversations because I feel like if I could ask those guys, Brandon, Carlos, if y'all are listening, call me. I would ask, you know everything about these baseball players, but if you showed up at their house, would they let you in? And I'm fairly certain, pretty high degree of certainty, that the answer would be no. And why? Because they may know everything about those baseball players, but they do not know them personally. In the same way, do you know Christ and does He know you? That's important. Last week, we looked at the first of... Uh, the first two of eight visions that Zechariah had, and those visions were for comfort for Israel. These two visions we're looking at are for the comfort of the leaders of Israel. And why? Because the, the, the leaders of Israel needed restoration. The priests were derelict in their duties. They were literally worshiping and sacrificing to idol, uh, idols within the temple courts, and God was not having it. And the kings, which is the line Zerubbabel comes from, who should have been guarding the law, their role, according to Deuteronomy, before the kingship was ever established, was to read the Word of God every day and see how things are measuring up. And instead, they followed after pagan practices and customs. And because of the priests and the kings leading the people into debauchery and sin and all sorts of things, Israel lost their place. And so God is bringing comfort. And again... Remember what I said, God is in the details. Because these are contemporary visions, but they speak of both a king and a high priest who would once for all finish things and complete things. 
So if you will, let's open to Zechariah chapter 3 and Zechariah chapter 4. And while I may reference other verses, we're going to stay here today. It says, Then he showed me, Joshua, the high priest, standing before an angel of the Lord and Satan, standing at his right hand to accuse him. It's interesting. Someone once asked me why a lot of churches in the South look like a courthouse. And I find that interesting. Because the heavenly throne is much like a courthouse. And if you notice, there's different parts of the Old Testament that show us this. Satan, when uh, in the book of Job, I just finished reading this in my personal study. In the book of Job, when God calls all the angels to account, Satan has to show up and tell God what he's been doing. And it is a courthouse in many respects before the throne of God because God is absolutely sovereign and sitting on the throne and nothing goes by that escapes his notice. And all things, including the enemy of God, are subject to him. And so here we see this royal court being adjourned, or excuse me, being called. There we go. Adjourned means dismissed. Being called into order. And there is Joshua the high priest. We're getting this a little bit, but he's wearing filthy rags. We'll look at that in just a second. But the prosecuting attorney is Satan. And this is who he is for us too, folks. Got to understand this. And he's getting ready to accuse the high priest. And let's face it, he's justified. Only time you'll ever hear me say Satan is justified. Because when Satan accuses, of, accuses us of our sins, he's usually right. Now, don't get me wrong. We have a defense attorney in our high priest, which we'll get into in just a little bit who stands every time Satan accuses those who belong to him and say it's already been paid. And we're seeing the glimpse of the divine in that today. Let's go on to verse 3. It says, The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord has uh, chosen Jerusalem. Rebuke you. Interesting. So before God, we see, by the way, when you see the Lord here, The Hebrew says the angel of the Lord. Going back to what we said last week, when you see the angel of the Lord in this regard, it is literally speaking of the Messiah, the image of God. So you you see, there's two attorneys present before the throne of God. One is accusing Joshua justifiably, but one is rebuking the prosecutor. Who but God can command and rebuke Satan but God? So I want you to hear this church. We need to see this vision. This vision, when we're looking at visions and we're looking at prophecies, we've got to understand there's a concept. This is Bible college stuff, but I hope you can bear with me for a second. There's a concept that I learned in Bible college called already but not yet. Already is dealing with what's going on right now in the prophecy. And what's going on right now in the prophecy is Joshua is being judged before the seat of grace. But Joshua is also pointing towards ourselves. Pointing towards Israel. Pointing towards the sin that we have done. Pointing towards the day where sin shall be redeemed once for all. Let's take a look again. See more of this. Let's go to uh, uh, the last part of this. He says, is not this the brand plucked from the fire? Let's pause for a minute. Again, there's so many details here. We can't let them pass. The brand. Anyone know what a brand is when you pluck it out of a fire? Hot what? Not iron. Back in that day. It is nowadays. If you work cattle, I could tell who's worked cattle. This is speaking of a burning branch that has been rescued from the fire. And why was the branch burning? Because Israel had disobeyed God. The priesthood had violated their mandate before God. But God. Paul talks about this in the book of Romans. And again, I want you to know, Paul is also talking about Israel there. But he's talking about those of us who are not Jewish. Raise your hand if you're Jewish. My wife and my sons, that's about it. 
He speaks of those branches that have been cut off but have been regrafted into the olive tree. This is what God is speaking of. When God talks in the Old Testament and you look at the rebuke of the prophets before Zechariah, those who existed before, God says, you are a branch that I'm going to cut off. And I'm going to throw you into the fire. Here, God is restoring His punishment. While it had to go through its rebuke. While it had to go through its purification, because that's what fire also means. God, who alone is able to do this, took the branch from the fire and restored it. So church, I want us to understand, there's people here who are struggling with things today. The reason I'm pausing here, and I'm not sure if we're going to get to chapter 4. But the reason I'm pausing here is I want us to understand, some of us have been dealing with things for years. We've been holding on to our sins for years. We've been holding on to unforgiveness. Christ may have forgiven us. Maybe even the people we wronged forgave us. But for some reason, we place ourselves on a higher judgment seat than God and not forgive ourselves. If God has rebuked you, God has disciplined you, God has chastised you, and God has pulled you out of the fire, who are you to not accept His forgiveness? You ever thought of that before? I have because I've dealt with not forgiving myself. I mean, two of my children have gone on to be with the Lord and and it it happened before they were born, but that, that was something I did. Yes, I hold on to that even though it's been almost 20 years. Yes, I know what it's like to hold on to things and not be or accept forgiveness. But God's not holding it against you. Jesus on the cross and the empty tomb are evidence of that. And so we've got to understand that we are also brands that have been plucked from the fire. It says, Now Joshua, verse 3, was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove filthy garments from him. That's how I know the angel of the Lord is divine. Because angels cannot forgive sin. Who but God can forgive sin? Wasn't that the rebuke against Jesus from the Pharisees? Y'all might recall the story of that quadriplegic man who was brought in on a mat because he couldn't walk and his friends wanted to see Jesus. And y'all might remember the story. The house was so crowded where Jesus was, they had to cut a hole in the roof and lower him in. I'm pretty sure insurance didn't exist back then and I'm pretty sure that wouldn't cover in most insurance companies. Stupid jokes, but there it is, folks. And the first thing Jesus said to him was not rise, pick up your mat, and walk. It was your sins are forgiven, son. And Jesus knew what the Pharisees were toiling out in their heart. And he looks at them and he says, You are asking yourselves, who but God alone can forgive sin? But to prove that the Son of Man has authority over sin, he looks down and says, I say to you, rise, pick up your mat, and walk. Because Jesus understood something. All of us here probably want something physically from God. It'd be nice to have some more money. It'd be nice to have physical health. It'd be nice to have so many things in life. Relationships restored with family, all those things. But Jesus understood the underlying problem was not the man's inability to walk. It was the fact that even if he was healed, he would still be in the wrong against God. And so here we see in this vision that Zechariah is having, this priest in a dirty garment, and it was stained by those who had come before him. It was inherited by his father, from his father, and so on all the way back to Adam. God says, let him be given white, fresh garments. Do you see how this is speaking towards a coming day? He wasn't merely talking of a restoration of the priesthood. Because the priesthood existed until the fullness of time was complete and Christ fulfilled all of God's promises regarding the law. He was speaking of the time when He Himself would deal once for all with the problem of sin. I hope you see that. Zechariah's visions and prophecies are strong and clear. Matter of fact, though, this harkens all the way back to what Isaiah said. We talked about it earlier. Y'all remember what I said. Sin has stained us, crimson. 
But God Himself washed us clean. Only God can do that. And loved ones, I hope you see this. This is still what's going on in heaven today. The accuser stands before God, staring at you, pointing at you, calling out you. And Christ says, no, it's been washed, it's been taken care of, it is clean. And yes, for a time, that temple did its purpose. But as we're going to see through the Scriptures, God is hearkening to a time when it will be once and for all taken care of, and we no longer need to sacrifice bulls and rams and goats, but God Himself has finally paid the price. I hope you see through these Old Testament Scriptures as we look through them that God always had you in mind when He sent Christ to the cross. God always had you in mind. God always knew who you would be. And yet, He sent His Son to die for you anyway. That lifts my spirits. Because I deserve everything I get if judgment were passed on me today. But instead, judgment passed on Him. And it's not by our works. I do believe baptism is absolutely of the utmost importance. But it's not the act of baptism that saves us because I've seen many people get baptized and live as if they had not been changed at all. It is the work of Christ upon the cross and through the empty tomb that makes it all work. It is what Christ has done. Which is why in baptism I can too crucify my flesh. I can be buried with Christ. I can rise again a new creation in Christ. It is because of what He did on that cross. It is because my high priest paid my penalty. He is before the Father whispering my name to the Father day and night. Not because of what I have done. Brian Doyle is not good enough. But He is. And because of that, I can be like Joshua's fellow priests, because my high priest is in shining white garments, I too, just as it says in Hebrews, can be that royal priesthood. Just like Peter says, just like Paul says, that royal temple being built up with stones because Christ has died and is victoriously living on the throne at the right hand of the Father. The Spirit of God dwells in me, and therefore, because of what He did, I am washed clean. Who but God can forgive sins? Praise God for our advocate in Jesus Christ. And he said to him, we're still in verse 4, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. Oh, praise God that He has made us clean. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right to access uh, among those who are standing here. That was the high priest's job. See, Zechariah and Joshua's jobs were quite different before God. It was the job of the prophet to represent God before the people, but it was the job of the priest, especially the high priest, to represent the people before God. And once a year, he had to make the proper sacrifices, and if he made the proper sacrifices, he could enter into the most holy place, that place that was covered by the veil, where the Ark of the Covenant and the the tablets and and the, the staff of Aaron that had budded and the jars of manna existed. He could go into the presence of God once a year if the sacrifices had been made. And God was saying, I will restore you to that. And here is really what was at stake in that royal courthouse. I read this um, this morning. I thought it was so brilliant. If Joshua had not been approved by God, the entire nation of Israel would be lost. But since Joshua was approved by God, God would redeem Israel. Think about that for a minute. Concerning the cross of Christ, if God did not approve of Jesus Christ, the cross means nothing. If Christ was
was just a man as we are. I, I believe C.S. Lewis put it this way. There's only three options for Jesus. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. He can't be a wise man and be a liar. Some people are calling him a wise man. He cannot be a wise man and be crazy. So the only other option we have that if Jesus truly is who he says he is, he is Lord of all things. If God had not approved of Christ, his sacrifice meant nothing. In the same way here, God approving of Joshua is pointing towards the Joshua that was literally to come. Not of the line of Levi, but of the line of David. That branch from the tree that had been cut off. You see how also that flaming brand represents a coming one who will restore? That's what Jesus is called, the branch. Jesus is literally being told or foretold of that you and I who can look now back and seeing all the scope of history behind us, not what's ahead, it's not my job, that because the branch has been restored, because the root of Jesse is on the throne, that because our great high priest is Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness for sins. I know it sounds like a broken record this morning, but God is repeating himself over and again in these visions because he wants us to get the point. We're stubborn creatures, and I'm a man, so I'm worse. And I'm Irish, so I'm worse than most men. I need to hear the point over and again because I'm stubborn. And when God repeats something, he knows our frame. He knows we're stubborn. Men, anybody else stubborn in this room? How many times do I got to hit myself with a hammer before I start getting the nail right? How many times has my wife had to say, you're going to need an ice pack before I stop doing it? And I'm grateful she stands by when I tell the boys, hey, watch this, and she knows I'm going to hurt myself. You're laughing because it's true, Seth. <laughs> I want us to hear the words, though, here. Verse 8, God's still speaking to Joshua. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest... You and your friends, meaning his other priests, who sit before you. For they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant, the branch. There it is again. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, take note of the number seven, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. And in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. God is saying, Joshua, I am going to restore the fortunes of Israel. Now, that stone is important. A lot of people wonder if that was the capstone of the temple. I don't believe it is. But every time you see the number seven, it, it harkens back to the days of creation. What happened on the seventh day? God had completed his work. Every time, I'm not a numerologist, but numbers are important in Scripture. And every time we see that number seven, it speaks of a completed work. Those seven eyes harken back to the eyes on the angel's wings that Taylor read about this morning. Those are the seven, uh, seven, it's the sevenfold spirit of God is what I believe it's called. But it sees everything. God sees it all. God knows it all. God is not indifferent to it all. God is well aware of what's happening. And that stone with the inscription, God is writing the name of the branch. The one who would restore and redeem all things. We do have a little bit of time to get into chapter 4 today. But I hope you see these images that God has given us. I hope that you see through the lens of Scripture. I'm going to tell you, and I, I, hate, I hate calling someone by name, but Andy Stanley said that we need to unhitch from the Old Testament. I honestly believe that's an abject falsehood. God speaks through the Old Testament. And if we are well aware and we are in the Scriptures, and if we are diving into God's Word and God's truth, we will see it. And some of you in this room have told me this. Well, that's just open to interpretation. Some of it, like these, these visions that are kind of bizarre sometimes, might be. But in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, God really lays it out through Paul that it's not up to interpretation. He says, Brothers, I implore you by the mercies of God 
to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is your true and spiritual worship, holy and pleasing to God. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that by testing. Listen to that word. You may know what the will of God is, what is good and pleasing and perfect. What scriptures did Paul preach from? He didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He was still living the book of Acts. It hadn't been written down. And Romans was a letter he had written. In his day, those weren't scriptures. Those were letters to friends that were so full of scripture and the Holy Spirit that they became scripture. Peter himself codified it. He preached from the Old Testament. He hearkened people to the promises of God through the Old Testament because that's what they had. We now have these writings that Peter and Paul and James and John have given us. But what do they all hearken back to? The Old Testament. They call us to the Word of God. You may know the will of God if you're in the Word of God. And not merely just the New Testament, but also the Old Testament. Because if you know the Old Testament, you see the promises of God fulfilled through the New Testament. Church, we need to be the people of the book inside the Word, allowing it to penetrate our hearts and rule over us. This way we can face anything. Because if we have the promises of God hidden within our hearts, we don't have to look at what's going on outside and worry. We have to look at the souls of our brothers and sisters and proclaim. And this is why we have been redeemed and restored and renewed. Be in the Word of God so that the lies of the enemy who stands before God accusing you anyway, fall dead on arrival. Verse 4, or excuse me, chapter 4, verse 1 tells us, And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me, like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? That's odd. I've never had a dream where someone says, Hey, what do you see? But this is a listen up moment. By the way, I, I've possibly said this before, but for those who are unfamiliar, all eight of these visions happen to Zechariah in a single night. Could you imagine waking up and trying to put that in your dream journal? But God is trying to get Zechariah's attention. And I said, <clears throat> continuing on, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on the top of it and seven lampstands on it and seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked to me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Say that name five times fast. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Why did he need to say that to Zerubbabel? Why? Because the line of Solomon had been disgraced. They went from being kings to being governors. And we look at by the time of Jesus, they went to being carpenters. Didn't God say, oh, how the mighty have fallen? Why does God need to open up with that to Zerubbabel? Because what might, must be going through his mind? His kingdom, which is his, is in ruins. And the promises of the prophets is he will never inherit that throne that David once sat upon. And so God says, not by might, nor by power. Excuse me, let's get back to that. Let me say it right. <laughs> Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The kingdom will be restored, but it's not by you. I go back to the promise in Joel chapter 2. You can read this for yourself, and I'll just give you the cliff notes. But through the prophet Joel, God predicted the armies of the Assyrians and the Babylonians coming in. He called them locusts. And they would, and anybody who's familiar with locusts, locusts devour everything in, in sight. Anyone ever have to deal with locusts? Grasshoppers. They eat everything. They eat everything. And still in the Middle East, over and again, every few, so, few years or so, 
all throughout Africa every few years or so. They literally still deal with swarms of locusts that if they're not prepared will come in and devastate farmlands. But in Joel chapter 2, God says, I will restore what the locust has eaten away. The biting locust and the devouring locust. God says, I will. I think about Isaiah when God wondered, and I, that always blows my mind, God wondering. But God wondered that there was no one to intercede on behalf of the people, and God says, then I will do it myself. And the promises again and again and again from Genesis 3 all the way into Malachi is that God Himself will do it. And so we talked about a high priest, now we're speaking to a king. Not a king... Well, a king will come from Zerubbabel, but not from the line that was Solomon's. But God himself will restore things. Some of us in this room have been trying so desperately hard to make things happen for ourselves. We get new toys, new boats, new uh, four-wheelers, new jobs, new homes. We pick up and go and all these things, and nothing seems to work. Anybody ever feel that way? I have. I try and try and try, and nothing works. This promise to Zerubbabel is also for you, because the cross is proof, and Christ risen and on the throne is proof. Not by might or power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. In John 15, when he's sitting down, actually John 14 through 17, when he's sitting down for the last time eating the the Passover with his disciples, Jesus says, it's good for you that I go away because I'm sending you another helper. I can be with you physically in one place. This helper can be everywhere and in everyone. God is promising the Holy Spirit. This was a literal promise to the kingdom of Israel that was being restored after God's uh, chastisement of it. But this is also a promise, not just merely to Israel, but to all. That God, and we're going to get into that promise because, oh, it's there. God Himself, by His Spirit, will restore things. Loved ones, the promise is not just merely as a kingdom, but it's for you too. You might feel your life is in pieces. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He goes on. Verse 7. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, Grace to it. Let's stop there. Again, these images are so wonderful. This is a different stone. It's not the stone with seven eyes, but the capstone. What's a capstone? Anyone want to enlighten me? Anybody get into masonry? What's a capstone for? You're not in masonry, so I'm grateful. It is the stone that ties it together. Otherwise known as the cornerstone which we find out in the Old and the New Testament, this promise repeated, the cornerstone that the builders rejected. And Zerubbabel is of the line of both Solomon and Nathan in the New Testament. And from Zerubbabel, when those lines merged once more, came Christ Jesus. Not a detail is wasted by our God. If, I'm not going to read them all. I'm not going to go and read those two lineages. I can't say half the names right now. But go and read the lineages of Matthew and Luke. Zerubbabel's the one thing they got in common and then the line splits again. Why? Because at that point, this is according to the uh, Mosaic law, if an heir was not produced for your brother or your cousin, your role was to produce it. Zerubbabel, again, produced for Solomon and Nathan. When Mary and Joseph came together, the Holy Spirit conceived Christ, but Joseph adopted Jesus as his son, restoring the line of Solomon, not by might or by power, but by his spirit. Excuse me, being the spirit of God. God has done it. 
In Christ Jesus, he has brought restoration. And it wasn't done like everyone was expecting. Think about what people were expecting at the time of Christ. Who do they want the Messiah to be? It's all right, church. You should know by now. Who do they want him to be? A warrior? A king? Matter of fact, they tried to actually kidnap Jesus after he fed him with just two loaves and, and five fish. They wanted him to be a king and a conqueror and a warrior who's going to remove Rome because Rome was a pest and no one liked him. I don't know what that means, but we'll talk later. Anyway, and Jesus wasn't any of those things. He was a homeless prophet in some, someone's eyes. He was a miracle worker. And he didn't preach against Rome. He preached against the true enemy of all men, sin. And his coronation... And his glorification did not come upon the lion seat of Solomon. It came upon a cross when he was raised up above everyone else. Becoming the curse for us. As it was said last week, he became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. Christ's glorification and Christ's redemption of earth did not come from force of arms. But from full submission to God conceived by the Holy Spirit. And when he said it is finished, he meant it. Verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Speaking of what church? You remember what we talked about? What house? Specific place. They worship there. Temple, there we go. I knew someone would get it. The reason he had to say this is because they had stopped work on the temple. They were trying to focus on, how am I going to eat? My house is in ruins. I need to build that up. God said, Zerubbabel started it. It's going to be finished in Zerubbabel's time. And if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, exactly that happened. But (laughs) God is in the details. Because from the lineage of Zerubbabel, as we said before, we have to look at this. This is amazing. You couldn't plan this stuff out if you tried over a period of some 500 years. From the lineage of Zerubbabel, Christ Jesus walked this earth. And from his hands, he brought healing to the nations. The house is you. And the hands are that of Christ Jesus. And by his work it shall be completed. He goes on. These seven are the eyes of the Lord which range through the whole earth. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees? By the way, he's speaking of the seven lampstands. What are the two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and said to him, what are these two branches of the olive trees which are beside the golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? He said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. This is a little more obscure, but when I was reading this and I was praying over it, I immediately thought of when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Who stood beside Jesus? Moses and Elijah. What do Moses and Elijah stand for? The law and the prophets. What are the faithful witnesses that have stood the test of time that I tell you week to week we need to stand by? That is the word of God which come through the law and the prophets. And I looked it up and I was reading through some of my sources and it's funny because there's a lot of different arguments as to what it could be, but several of them pointed to this fact that it's the law and the prophets and if we look to the Mount of Transfiguration, God shows that who stood by Christ when the work was needing to be completed? Moses and Elijah. What did Jesus say? Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one of my words shall pass away. He was the author of the law. And I'm going to tell you, at the end of all things, when everyone is judged, what shall they be judged by? The books of the law. God is not an unjust God. If we do not stand and we are not written in the book of life, what's going to happen? We will be judged by our works. I don't know about you. I don't want that. I'm dead in the water if that's me. 
So I am going to do all I can to stand by the faithful witnesses who stand by the branch, the stone, the throne of God. Loved ones, Jesus is our high priest and our king. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. As he said, if you had known Moses, you would have known me. So if you know the prophets, they were talking of me. They looked forward to my day. And every single time Jesus was accused in his day, which he was, who did he hearken back to that bore witness about him, that stood by him when even his, his disciples abandoned him? He went to the law and the prophets because every blessed word of God speaks of Christ. I can find Jesus on every single page of Scripture, even in Esther, where God's not mentioned once. So loved one, if the law and the prophets stood by Christ, who are we to shun them? And my commitment to you as your preacher, and I pray you return and reciprocate this commitment, is I'm going to be in this word every single day. I'm going to be standing on the faithful witnesses because they still speak truth. I'm going to be praying for you. Will you stand upon the witnesses and pray for me? Jesus Christ is returning. And I'm not sure how it's going to go down. Some people think there's a rapture. Some people think that there's all sorts of things. But if I'm standing by the faithful witnesses, however it goes down, I will be found ready. Loved ones, stand firm. Just as the witnesses have stood this test of time and stand firm. Listen to the voice of God. Trust in your high priest and your king. And though life may not be easy, watch restoration occur. Because God, just like he promised to Israel, says, I know the plans I have for you. A lot of us understand that this is to Israel to be restored, but it's also to us. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. That is only found through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There is no other way by which we may, we may be redeemed and saved. Jesus lived according to all the righteousness of God. He fulfilled the word of God in himself in every single way. There was not one sin in him. It says in Hebrews, he was tested and tempted in every single way and yet did not sin. And he even suffered in those temptations. And then he bore your sin and mine upon the cross and sits at the right hand of the Father, our faithful high priest, who is advocating for us day and night. He desires relationship with us. He died and rose again, that you and I may have new life now, but also in the time to come. What are you waiting for? So loved ones, as the elders come forward, as uh, Randy comes to close us out, what are you standing on? Seems like everything you build is a sandcastle and just falls apart. What are you standing on? What are you building on? Jesus himself says this. He who hears these words of mine and does not hear them is like a foolish man who builds his house upon a foundation of sand. And when the rain came and the floods came and the wind beat upon the house, the house fell and great was its, great was its fall. I want to be the wise man who built it on the rock. And the only rock and firm foundation is in Jesus Christ. Will you join me in that? If you need prayer today, I want to invite you. We've got some brothers and sisters already in the back of the room. If you don't want to get up because it's hard, turn to somebody next to you and ask if they'd pray for you. Elders and myself, well, don't approach Randy while he's singing. It'll be awkward. But after church, he's available. I know it. Alan and myself, Ricky, uh, who couldn't be here today, keep him in prayer. Um, Nathan's in the hospital with pneumonia. We're here for you. Most of you, if not all of you, have my number. And I put my cell phone on there for a reason. And most of you, if not all of you, know I'll talk to you. Even if I have to call you back because I'm sleeping, I'll call you back. Whatever it takes, we're here for you. We're here to get you to where we're going, and we're going to Christ Jesus. Take the opportunity. 
He died for you. He lives for you now. Die for him and live for him now. And watch how he restores what our sin has crumbled away. Let's stand and worship him now. Bailey's not here this morning. Be in prayer over him and Jennifer and the kids. They're driving back from Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, they were at a wedding this weekend. So be in prayer for them and not just them, but everybody who's traveling on the roads this morning. Uh, we've got a lot of people who are out sick. Just remember people in your prayers. Uh, and then tonight, we're still doing all our studies like normal, right? We're planning on it. Um, be safe on the roads. Alan, where are y'all meeting? Tim and Shannon's house. If you don't know how to get there, it's a good home fellowship group. Love to, they'd love to see you there. My group's meeting here um, in the room below the office. And Larry's group is meeting in the, the fellowship hall. We want to encourage you. If you want to dive deep into the Word uh, and be able to discuss the Word with somebody, this is a good opportunity to do it. So. And the kids just are everywhere. So. <laughs> Never know where they'll be next. All right. Any more announcements? Anything else? All right. Let's dismiss. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the glorious day we've had today to be in your house. And Father, we thank you for the blessings that you bestow upon us. And Father, the things we, we take for granted each and every day that you provide for us. And, and Father, for the, the word that's been put forth, Father, that may be encourages for us. May we uh, cause us to do things we all. Father, as we go our separate ways, we pray that you will be with us till we can turn once again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.